Hi, everybody. It's Dana Stangle with Taranga Ranch, and welcome to Tuesday at 3 o'clock for our kids programming. I'm so glad you could make it today. Last week and the weeks before that, we were talking about bats, and that was super fun, and I loved it. And it made me think about the desert because lots of bats live in the desert, right? In fact, Bats are one of the pollinators for, for a cactus, right? So that's pretty cool. And I was wearing my bat earrings last week and the weeks before that, if you remember. But today, I don't know if you can see, I'm going to get a little closer. I got my spider earrings in today, <gasps> right? Because spiders also live in the desert. I knew that you would know that as soon as I showed you my earrings. So in fact, you probably already knew that anyway. So today um, we're going to start this, this unit on the desert with one of my favorite stories. This one is called The Cactus Hotel and it is by Brenda Gwiberson. I hope I pronounced that correctly and illustrated by Megan Lloyd. And you will see that the illustrations in this book are really amazing as well. This is a wonderful book. Um, and I hope it doesn't fall apart while I'm reading it because I have had this book for mm, probably more than a decade and it is still one of my favorite books about the desert for kids. So, um, Cactus Hotel. Here we go. We're looking at the desert, right? And this book is sort of, um, it, it pulls out some main characters in the way of plants and animals that are probably from the Arizona desert. But here in California, we do have a desert. Where's my vocabulary? We have the Mojave Desert. And some of the things that I'll be talking about today, in fact, most of the things I'll be talking about today are also things that are applicable to our own Mojave Desert. So for those of you that like to read things, that's what that looks like. And it doesn't sound like it looks, does it? But it's Mojave, that's how it's pronounced. So there's that. And this book is going to be about a special kind of a cactus this is a saguaro cactus, and he's special. And um, he lives in the desert in Arizona, um, as does the Palo Verde tree, which is another character in this story. Would you bring me, I brought in a pot of a cactus. I wanted to, would you bring that here? So I also love to share things that go with our books, right? Not just the books, because just the book alone, when there's so many other things we can add, you know, that's what I like to do. So, so here's the desert and, oh, it might be in there. Actually, it might be on there. On a hot, dry day in the desert. A bright red fruit falls from a tall saguaro cactus. Plop, not in there, it's right in the hallway. It splits apart on the sandy floor. 2,000 black seeds glisten in the sunlight. When the air cools in the evening, an old pack rat comes out and eats the juicy fruit. He skitters across the sand. A seed left clinging to his whiskers falls off under a Palo Verde tree. So again, look at these. These illustrations are just amazing. Now, you might have a cactus at home. Lots of people will plant a cactus because if you're in California, as many of our viewers are, 
we go through something that's called a drought. This is how it's spelled. We have another word here that does not look the way it sounds, does it? Is it drugit? No, it's drought. And a drought is what happens when you don't have a lot of rain. And there are certain plants and animals that do well without a lot of rain. And here in Southern California, even though we're not all in the desert, we don't get a lot of rain, do we? And so many of us have, I literally pulled this out of my garden, many of us have a cactus, right? So they bloom, they'll get little flowers on them. I'm sad that this one isn't blooming right now. This one does bloom. And they'll get a little flower that will last a very short time and then go away. And I bet you have a cactus at your house too. But you probably don't have a saguaro. Saguaros are special and they get to be huge. And so what did we learn from this page? We've got, um, we've got this cactus fruit that is plopping down to the ground. It's got all kinds of seeds. That fruit feeds the pack rat. That fruit, uh, and we're going to learn more what else this cactus does for his little universe. One thing I want to talk about is as we read, I want you to notice how many different species of both plants and animals this cactus provides for. That brings to mind the fact that this is a keystone species. We usually think of keystone species when it comes to animals, right? We know that wolves are keystone species and beavers are keystone species and mountain lions are keystone species, right? I always think of these big, magnificent animals, but it's not always a big animal. Sometimes it's a small animal. Sometimes it's a plant, right? So the swarrow is a keystone species and you're about to learn why. So that was a good place for the seed to drop. The spotted ground squirrel, which is another animal living in the desert, looking for something to eat, doesn't see it. And a house finch chirping high in the pale of verde doesn't see it either. So now we've got lots of dry rain days and now there's a rain in the desert because it does rain in the desert, just not very much. Now you've got, this is the pale of verde. He's already a mature tree. And here's the teeny tiny seed from the saguaro cat, from the saguaro. Okay. And these guys have a really interesting relationship. So a lot of times this pale of verde tree will work as what they call a nursery tree for the little saguaro. This guy needs a little bit of protection as he's growing, right? He needs a little bit of shade, a little bit of protection from the elements and the nearby Palo Verde provides that. So we're gonna talk, we've got a big fancy word for this we're gonna talk about later, but basically know that for now. The Palo Verde is considered a nursery plant for the saguaro and they often grow next to each other like this. And people that are trying to propagate this guy will often plant one of these. So the Palo Verde is protecting it from the hot sun and the cold nights. And after 10 whole years, this cactus is only four inches high because he is not a sprinter. He's in it for the marathon. Just wait and see. So then there's the rainstorm and the desert is blooming with color because there's been some rain. and. This cactus, look at him now. He's very round. That's one thing that's really cool about the saguaro. As he takes in the water from the rain, the whole body of the cactus sort of swells. 
It's really interesting and cool. It's a really amazing adaptation for desert life, right? So then again, we've got the pack rat. And how is he benefiting? He's drinking the water that drips off the tree. And now looking for a place to make a nest. All right. Now, who do we have in this picture? One of our favorites. There's the coyote. He also lives in the desert. Coyote is so opportunistic. He can live in so many different landscapes, truly. Here's the swallow. Here is, I think that's a jackrabbit. So when there's no rain, the cactus uses up the water and looks thinner. And he is still here and look, as this cactus gets to be a certain size, he is creating shade also. So this little jackrabbit gets to spend a minute in the shade, which is really cool, literally. And not only that, but you can see he's taken a little chunk out and he can chew on the soft flesh. All right, now look at that. 50 years later, is that 50? Yes, after 50 years, now look at how big the suaro is compared to the Palo Verde tree. <gasps> okay, guess what's gonna happen, right? He's taking all the resources now. He's not gonna have enough. He's eventually gonna die away. That's okay. This guy's only 50. Only 50. He's still very young. All right. So now after 50 years, he's finally got a bloom on top. So that's kind of cool. There's a hummingbird benefiting from that. And the jackrabbit is still below getting the shade, right? And now after 50 years, now this guy bloomed and now he's going to bloom every year. So that's really cool. But for one night only. So better be paying attention. What? All right. And then when that happens and these flowers are happening, they're probably happening on more than one suaro at the same time, right? And then all these guys come in and they're like, oh, we can't wait to benefit from the flowers in one way or another, right? Either they're benefiting from the animals that come to the flowers or they're benefiting from the flowers themselves. And you've got bats and you've got woodpeckers and roadrunners and you've got all kinds of different birds. And bees, bees are a big part of pollination in the desert too. They're very important. All right. And, oh, this is beautiful. A woodpecker coming to eat. It's like, oh. And then he says, you know what? This is such a great place. I think I'm going to stay. I really like this. So now the hotel has started. Because the woodpecker is just the guy to make a little hole in there, right? What? Sure enough, that's what he did. He goes right to work. The only tool he uses is his long, hard beak. Tap, tap, tap. And he makes a comfy space for himself. Now, inside this cactus, there are all these, like, ribs that are made of this woody substance. So it's thick in there, and it's strong. And this cactus has the ability to sort of make a little scab around this hole so that it doesn't affect the way the cactus is growing. So this guy can live in there and the cactus is fine with it. And this nest is weatherproof. It's shady on hot days. It's warm and insulated on frosty nights. And the woodpecker will eat the insects that could possibly bring disease to the cactus. So this is a relationship that works for both parties, right? Now, oh my goodness, you guys. This is an 18 foot tall cactus hotel. 
The woodpecker has a new hole in the trunk. Farther up, a white winged dove makes a nest on the arm. He's got an arm coming out. And they feel safe and they are safe. They're up high off the ground in a prickly plant. All around the desert. Have you ever looked, have you ever thought about the ground looking like this? But this is definitely a good representation of how things might look in the desert, even in the chaparral where we live. So we might just see some holes in the ground, but there's a lot going on under there, isn't there? Ants and mice, lizards and snakes, rabbits and foxes. There's a hole for every size animal. And after 150 years, there are holes of every size in this cactus as well. It weighs eight tons, about as much as five automobiles. And you can see the Palo Verde tree has given up the ghost. No more Palo Verde tree, but that's okay. That's life in the desert, my friends. Okay, so now, oh my gosh, look at this. It's blooming, it's buzzing, everything is, it's, it's, it's a living hotel, right? Everybody wants to live there. Birds are laying eggs, pack rats are laying their young, even insects and bats live there. And when one animal moves out, another one will move in. After 200 years, the cactus sways and blows down in the wind. Oh, no. So sad for the Cactus Hotel, right? Right? Hmm. It's sort of like when a tree falls in the forest, right? The creatures that lived up high must find other homes, but those that prefer to live low, move right in. A millipede, a scorpion, and many ants and termites quickly find homes in this toppled hotel. There's a collared lizard involved because he's looking for insects, right? And a ground snake huddles in the shadows, right? So lots of animals can still make use of the Cactus Hotel, even when it's not alive anymore. And then, there you go. There's the one that, that fell, still full of life, surrounded by the others that are also still doing pretty good. So this particular, this saguaro, only in Northern Mexico and the American Southwest. It's a really special and iconic species. But again, almost everyone has seen a cactus somewhere and many people have one at their home. So there's your connection. Now, what were we talking about? Like, who was it that spent time in that cactus? Hmm, who was that? Oh. Oh, who was that? Well, one of the friends that lives in the Cactus Hotel is your friendly neighborhood arachnid, right? So it's a funny little puppet, but this one is a spider and Spiders live in the desert, and spiders are an animal that is particularly adapted to the desert, right? Because they're not warm-blooded, so if it's cooler at night, they can be cooler. If it's warmer at night, they can be warmer. These guys can tolerate some pretty extreme temperatures. This is his fat little abdomen. These are his eight legs. Notice his lack of antennae, right? So we didn't talk, what, 
What do you have if you have more than one cactus? Cacti. I know you weren't expecting that. Crazy. Some people also say cactuses, though. And both are okay. Suaro. Doesn't look like it's spelled either, does it? And this is the kind of cactus that lives in Arizona and Northern Mexico. And even a little bit in California. Oh, this is a fun one. Succulent. This is a plant that stores water in the leaves. And the leaves are often puffy. Like an aloe vera plant. You might have one of those around as well. Now, I was going to talk about a big one. Are you ready? You might not be ready. But if you are ready, I'm going to share it anyway, because this one will wow your parents tonight at dinner. Parasitic symbiosis. What? Basically, this is what's happening when the suaro grows in the shadow of the Palo Verde tree. Because eventually the nutrients are taken away from the Palo Verde tree. For a while, it's just sort of symbiosis, right? They're living together along in the same area, sharing resources, right? And sort of being near each other and probably helping each other. But as that suaro overtakes the Palo Verde, the Palo Verde doesn't have enough nutrients to keep living. So that is an example of parasitic symbiosis. And parasitic simply meaning that one is sort of taking advantage of the other, right? Like a parasite. You've heard that word before. Um, and then another really funky one. We already talked about the drought, right? And that's when there isn't a lot of rain and deserts experience drought. And then there's a further one. And you probably hear this one even more. Drought resistant. That's something that resists the drought. It's like, oh, I don't care. You don't want to bring me a lot of water? I'm fine. And do we know someone who's drought resistant? We do. And do we know someone else who's pretty drought resistant because he has all kinds of adaptations for survival? Yes, we do. So this guy, if he's if 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 it's really hot and he needs to get out of the sun, he can curl himself all up to protect his legs. And then at night, when it's cooler, he can wake up and go do his thing, right? Being nocturnal is one adaptation of a spider to exist in a desert environment because the nighttime is usually um, e easier than the daytime. Although the nighttime in the desert can be really harsh as well. In fact, that's one of the things that makes the desert the desert, right? Really extreme temperatures, really hot during the day, in the summer, really cold at night, right? Even in the summer. So what else? And do you know how much of the earth's surface is desert? So of the land mass that's on earth, one third of it is desert. And in fact, in many places, people are trying to fight the process, I should have this as a vocabulary word, of desertification. I'll have it next week. Desertification is when the desert starts to expand, right? Because there's a water cycle. And when there's water in the ground and it evaporates up, weather patterns create rain. When there's no moisture in the ground, it can't evaporate up and there isn't rain. It's sort of dependent upon rain blowing in and smaller bits of rain. So when the rain stops happening, that desert area keeps growing. And it's really hard for humans to live in the desert. We are not like spiders. We're not cold-blooded. There's another animal that does pretty well in the desert. And I had a picture. Where's that picture? Oh, here it is. Aha. 
I like this guy. This is a barefoot gecko. And he's like a camel. What? How is a reptile like a camel, right? One is warm-blooded, one is cold-blooded. What is she talking about? They both have special desert adaptations. This guy, I want you to look at that tail. This is sort of a skinny tail in general for this kind of lizard. Um, he probably hasn't had a drink in a little bit, but this tail is like his suitcase, just like the camel's hump is like his suitcase. So they live in the desert. They're hanging out in the desert. They're not getting a lot to drink. When they do get something to drink, how can they store it in case they don't get something to drink tomorrow? Enter camel hump. Enter gecko tail. So, and in fact, this gecko tail is even more interesting than the camel hump because, so he's carrying all his electrolytes and extra whatever he needs around in his tail. But if he gets afraid, if he becomes afraid of a predator, something will happen where he starts to run and his tail falls off. It's called caudal autotomy. That's another good vocabulary word I should write down for you. Basically, the tail breaks off, keeps wiggling around while the lizard takes off. It's a very special adaptation. The bad news about it is the lizard got away and now he lost his suitcase. So now it's gonna take him a little while to get his act together again, to rebuild this up. And he will. In, in fact, I'm not sure what this tail, if this tail, it's hard to tell from this picture, but a lot of times you can tell when their tail has fallen off and regenerated. So that is another cool desert adaptation. And I hope you had some fun today with us learning about the Cactus Hotel. Next week, we're going to talk more about reptiles in the desert. And we're going to talk about this book, Rattlesnake Dance. This is also one of my all-time favorite books. And uh, I really can't wait to share it with you next week. Some, there's some great pictures, there's a great story, and there's some super practical information about coexisting on this planet with rattlesnakes, which, especially if you live in Southern California, you need to know how to do that. So that is my story for today. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope that you will join us next week on Tuesday at three o'clock for Rattlesnake Dance and for more fun, exciting talk about life in the desert. I am Dana Stangle. This is Taranga Ranch. And thank you so much for joining us today. We'll see you very soon.